Evening, 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 everyone. Mike, Akil, how are we? Good, good, thank you. Very good. Yourself? Very good indeed, thank you. You had a good day, Mike? Very good. Eight o'clock start. All, all appointments all the way through till five today. Absolutely manic, but uh, very enjoyable. Well, we can talk about exactly that volume in the property market. So obviously on this evening's uh, live chat, um, which is across a couple of different platforms. Um, really pleased to have a kill with us and Mike as well, where we're really going to get into the details of property investment. We're going to get into the details of landlords, portfolio landlords, and all the different ways that lenders at the moment are offering different investment strategies out um, through different finance options. So I'm excited to get into this one because it's really talking about buy-to-lets and property investing. Um, all of us on here are landlords ourselves. Um, obviously investing in property when the right deal comes available. Now what we have to talk about is what's the right finance that's available as well. Um, so let's have a little bit of a conversation. But first of all, Akil, just a little bit of an intro. You're obviously the MD of our mortgage broker. A little bit of an intro and a bio to yourself. Thank you, Ian. And thanks, Mike, for having me on tonight's show. Um, as, as Ian said, my name's Akil from our mortgage broker. We specialize in all things property and mortgage finance. So whether you're a first time buyer, portfolio landlord or a commercial investor, we like to think of um, us as a one stop shop for all mortgages and property finance. Love that. And Mike, obviously your background for everyone that's uh, not seen you on one of these before. Uh, 15, 16 years a letting agent, 10 or 12 years as a landlord in my own right. Brilliant. So we have got the right people for this conversation. Um, on the agenda today, we're going to kind of talk about 2020 and what went on with um, what went on with the banks and the mortgage options, the finance options, uh, and where that's changed moving into this year. We're going to talk about um, with Akil some new lending options as well, um, whether it's student lets or holiday homes or serviced accommodation Airbnb, um, and where the lending sits with that too. We're going to hopefully offer some help, advice and tips to first time landlords or first time property investors. Um, talk about BRR, buy, refurb and refinance, um, which is becoming very popular at the moment. I know you're quite passionate about that, Akil. Uh, talk about ways around different finance options for ERC penalties, expectations for 2021. And obviously, we're going to cover tenant demand and trends at the moment and what we're actually seeing from tenants so that landlords know what the tenants are looking for. So I guess the best place to start is 2020 and where we sit now. Was there a big surprise in property investing, buy-to-let mortgages for you, Akil, with the banks as we ended the year? Was there any surprises and shocks for you with everything that had gone on with the pandemic? Um you know, when, when the pandemic came about in the first quarter of 2020, you know, I thought I thought we we're going to have a massive price dump. I thought, you know, UK residential property is going to fall flat on its knees and, and we're going to go into, uh, you know, negative equity and so on. But what's actually happened is very surprisingly, as 2020 went on, we found that we were doing more and more business each and every month compared to 2019, for example. So from a from a brokerage perspective, it's been phenomenal. And, you know, you and I always speak on um, often, often, I should say, and, and business is growing for both our sides, uh, for, for the positive side, I would say for sure. Um, we had a bit of a, a downturn in terms of the product suite that was available in 2020, predominantly in lockdown one, where a lot of lenders were reconfiguring, working from home, getting the tech right, getting the applications right, and and and, and dealing with the, uh, the holiday payments that they put out there by the government. But... Ever since then, during the end of 2020 and the beginning of 2021, we're seeing we're seeing heights of you know pre Lehman's uh, crash with loan to values at 95 percent now. We've got great interest rates on offer and and various mortgage types available now as well. So whether it's a student let, a HMO let, Airbnb, you know we're back at those great loan to values and more importantly at great rates. No, it's good. It's interesting stuff. Mike, from your perspective, what, what what were the trends with buy to let investors? Were you were you surprised with how they kind of reacted to everything? Yeah, I think it, it, it the whole market took everyone as a surprise because as as Akil said, if, if if you're gonna shut down the entire economy, you imagine house prices are gonna go with it um on a on a confidence basis, but it but it went the other way as people needed different things. Um, from a from a rental perspective, 
what I what I've seen is is tenants if they're happy in their houses they're staying longer and longer and longer um, and that is giving landlords more confidence that there's more stability. So if you've got a three bedroom house or a two bedroom house and it's well maintained, it's well kept, your tenants are going to stay there because they're not going to move. They're not going to move unduly at this time. And that's meant that the supply of new properties to the rental market has been really constrained. And with that, it's in, in the southeast, it's pushed prices up, um, even though people's incomes in some cases have been hit. The demand for houses has just meant that house prices have risen. I can't speak for London because I'm, I'm not there, but obviously outside of London where we are in the home counties, there's just so few properties coming available. If I speak to another buy to let investor and they say, well, what should I do? Should I buy? Should I, should I not buy? Should I hold? Just, well, just, just, just take a look at Rightmove. Take a look at Zoopla. See how many houses are available to rent and how many, available, how many have been rented you'll see there's there's two, three houses available in each postcode at any one time. So there's just a desperate extra demand for, for property, which means people can buy in with confidence that, that tenants will just walk into their house the minute they take the keys. Confidence is key, isn't it? I think that's a key word that you mentioned at the end there. And I think there is confidence with the, with the lenders at the moment, Nikhil, in, in take re residential out of it. There's clearly confidence there because the interest rates have dropped for the last three months running. But what new lending options are there? What new finance options are there? And what are, what are the banks trying to appeal to in terms of investment strategy? This, is there different models that they're looking into at the moment? Or is it kind of very standard buy to let resi still? What's what's your thoughts on that? What are you seeing? Um, it's a great question. And, 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 and there's lots of positives coming out of that space. Now, lenders contact us often to ask what are the trends what are your clients looking for and this is predominantly targeted for those portfolio landlords you know are they looking at diversifying their portfolio to do airbnbs hmos multiple lettings are they looking at multi-unit free old blocks and we give that feedback to out to those lenders to say our clients want this type of products you need to be more innovative and create those products and those type of criteria that adopt to the current trends now Predominantly, especially in the southeast, where the yields are not so great, but capital appreciation is great. And once we have that bounce back, the capital and I'm talking about London and predominantly the home counties will bounce back with a vengeance. So we've seen a great positive attitude from a number of lenders over the last two quarters in particularly great interest rates, great innovation with products. And, and great rates. Um, so it's phenomenal what they're doing. And more importantly, actually, is is their turnaround time. You know, you know, you guys are well placed in that space. You put a property on, on right move, for example, on a Monday, you've already got queues of people that want to view the property on a Tuesday. So demand is there. And what that needs to happen then is the lenders need to understand the demand levels and contribute from a lending perspective. And likewise, as brokers, we need to adapt to that and, and work you know, all hours of the day because we understand our portfolio landlords don't just work nine to five. And, and we've adapted to that as a brokerage. And we do work seven days. We take pride in our job you know, and we take it personally. So um, it's all positive from our side. Uh, it is very tiring, but listen, I'd rather be in this position than, um, than uh, jobless. So um, I'll, I'm, 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 I'm grateful. Absolutely. I think we all are because we're almost privileged, aren't we, in a way, compared to a lot of the other industries out there that are, we're having a bit of a, a special moment at the moment in the property market where it is it is going a little bit bananas. And I definitely think there's more buy to let investors out there than I was expecting to see. And it's interesting to hear the different types of um, options that are available for different strategies as well. Mike, would you have a particular kind of opinion on where you think the the risky but potentially rewarding option could go down or what's the kind of safe bet what's the what's the secure bet in property investing at the moment would you say the the certainly the safe bet is in is in family homes because house prices are on the increase um and with that it means that people who have children but don't own a property are going to be cut out of that even more than they were before so you you if you if you buy to rent a three-bedroom family house there's a good chance if you put the right tenant in there they'll be there for five six seven years which from a landlord's perspective from a management perspective 
makes life very, very easy. It's very much a hands-off as possible investment rather than the constant turnover of a of an inner city flat. Um, there's there's obviously more risk in in things like Airbnbs and in HMOs because if we go into lockdowns, that's where you have more transient people, more spur of the moment people renting property. Whereas if you've got a family, it's harder to move a family with two kids, as we all know, than it is just to move yourself uh, from a from a temporary accommodation. So, so for me, the the, the safe option is 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 all ha- is and always has been a three bedroom house. But right now, the way house prices are moving, there's a good chance when you agree an offer on a house by the time it's completed it's gone up in value yeah i'd, I'd echo it i'd echo what uh, mike said and i'd add also is um um particularly for those portfolio investors out there you've got to diversify and there's two main main focuses and i speak to a lot of portfolio landlords is you've got to look at your blended loan to value rate across your portfolio and the sweet spot and where you want to be is at around the 60 percent loan to value rate because even if we do have a price correction, they can stomach those those, those five or ten percent price corrections. And the other advantage is at sixty percent loan to value, you're going to get really really favourable rates. And then ultimately, every lender is going to want to chop your hand off and take your business for that. So I think I think where you are on a blended approach on a loan to value is very very important. And again, don't put all your eggs in one basket. You know, as a property investor, I love my three bed houses. It's a safe bet. And Mike, you're 100% correct. But if you're looking to become a bit more entrepreneurial, you may want to just look at the other options, the other higher yielding options, just to take advantage of the higher yields that might be out there predominantly in the HMO space um, and the multi-unit, especially around the student-led space as well. So, you know, don't keep your eggs in one basket is my uh, suggestion. And and actually, um, it's the output I'm getting from a lot of our portfolio landlords that they want to diversify, but do it in in their own time and once they're confident in themselves. No, it's great advice. There's a couple of people checking in to say hi. A um, couple of guys here saying hi. So it's good to see everyone watching. And if you are watching, don't forget, yes, we're live. And even if you're watching the recording afterwards, ask us a question. We'll, we will deal with it live or we will respond to you after we've uh, after we finished and um, we all work late as a kill mentioned so you know we're happy to reply to comments all the way through the evening until we're asleep um so no worries there at all so good advice there what about um kind of buying refurb and refinance a, a kill would you say as the property market appears to be moving upwards at the moment that is a good option for people to look into. There are some um, people doing good good deals potentially as well, where we're rushing and panicking for the stamp duty holiday. So there's options there for people to pick up a, a really good bargain where people are saving money on stamp duty. Do you think that looking at this abbreviation of BRR, is that kind of the way to, to go for a lot of investment landlords at the moment? Yeah, no, it's a great question, Ian. And and let me just break that down for those uh, viewers of, of watching this. So BRR or BRR, the strategy means basically you're buying a property, you're going to refurb the property, and then you're going to refinance at the uplift value, right? So that's, that's a breakdown of what BRR stands for. Um, it's been around for many, many years. Um, it depends on your uh, your strategy. It depends on how experienced you are and ultimately what the end game is. So in short, you've got numerous options to buy a property. You buy a property using your physical cash. You can buy a property using a bridging loan or you can buy a property through a traditional mortgage. Now, let's go down the traditional mortgage route. If you're buying a property with a view to refurb the property and then refinance at the uplift value, you can do so because there are mortgage lenders out there that offer you a mortgage product with no ERC penalties, so i.e. no early repayment charges. And that's a great and that's the most cheapest way of getting into a deal by, by taking out a traditional mortgage rather than a bridging loan. Then you're going to add value to the property by bringing it up to the market standard or increasing its value, you know, being the the top property on the street. And then what you're going to do is come and see us again. And then we refinance at the top end at the new market value to pull out as much cash as possible, including the refurb money in order for you to go shopping again and do it again. Now, the Brewer strategy is amazing. It does work very well. 
but we like to work with our clients and understand their 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 investing strategy going forward and ultimately making the numbers work and how do you know you're going to make the numbers work and the key here is you always make money or don't make money on day one of purchase so you've got to buy right then you've got to compare what you're going to do to that property tomorrow to make it uh, more relevant in that market space and ensure that you do get top dollar in terms of um, the surveyor when he comes out to revalues the property. So it's a very much, it's a very uh, buoyant market at the moment, the BRR strategy. I would certainly recommend it to all property investors. But the key here is to understand the numbers. How much are you buying it for? How much are you spending on it, including contingencies? And what's the end market value? So do get in touch with us, you know, not here to sell ourselves or anything like that, but do the numbers, speak to your brokerage, speak to the agents as well, because the agents are the guys and girls that are going to provide you with today's numbers. And then once you've uplifted the value, they'll give you a um, a good reflection on what the new market would look like. It's exciting stuff. Um, it's something that I've done in the past, uh, Mike. And I guess from your perspective, it's, it's something that's probably important to look at the deal, look at the location. So you, you want to invest in a, in a really good deal that's in a great spot for hopefully equity growth um, organically, as well as obviously the work that you're going to do. I guess you have to really know your costs, really know exactly what you're um, spending money on, because a lot of people can be guilty of um, refurbing a property to a level that they want to live in when it's not always required to get to that specification. You want to do it properly, but you don't want to overspend because it kills kills the finance option. Um, and then look at talking to someone like a kill that's really going to work with you to make sure that the loan penalties within that are kind of set so that it's going to make it affordable as well and i think what when you do something like this a kill i would imagine hopefully you'll agree but it's vital that you kind of almost have that trusted power team before you get into it you need that solicitor that broker that accountant maybe an estate agent not one to plug an estate agent but you need the right estate agent working with you on it as well um that's probably how it becomes a win i would say no, I certainly agree with everything you said there, Ian. You have to surround yourself with the right people. You need the right agents. You need the right finance broker. You know, right, you need the right conveyancer and so on and so on. Even an architect, even a planning consultant. So if you are looking to get into property for the first time or venture into becoming a portfolio landlord or grow your portfolio further, please, please, please surround yourself with that right power team. And when you're discussing your, your views, your goals and so on, Make sure you're speaking to people that have been there, done it, wore the T-shirt, you know. No offense to those that are living the dreamland, but at the end of the day, it's your blood, sweat and tears that you're putting into this, this venture of yours. So do speak to the relevant people that have got skin in the game, been there, done it and wore the T-shirt as well, for sure. Experience is vital. Um, Mike, anything to add on that from your perspective? Is, is there, are you seeing those sort of deals available at the moment that you think, you know what, that would make, that would make a great one to purchase? do some work to extend, go over the garage, maybe um, out the yeah, back. I think, yeah, you, you've just you've just answered the you were just, just just given my answer away, essentially, with the last sentence there. Um, although houses and good houses are obviously selling quickly and they're selling at a premium at the moment because there's so many buyers in the market. It doesn't mean that by the time you've finished your purchase, it won't be worth more than you agreed for it. And also, yeah, look at where you can improve the value. Um, and Akil mentioned a planning consultant or an architect uh, or a builder, someone who, other than you, you can put the floor, you can email the floor plan to, they can draw all over it with a biro and send it back and say to you, yeah, it's great that it looks like that now, but do this, add a bedroom, find a way to, to add value, add an ensuite that wasn't there out of wasted wardrobe space um cupboards over stairs whatever it might be that make that turns it from a house that was suitable in the 60s 70s and 80s to something that is desirable now and that's where i see the val the capital value being added yeah the rental value will tick up it will never drastically pay for itself in that sense but you you, you can certainly put the, the capital value on top of it no problem at all even in even in the back even in the market right now and I think we're talking don't, about trends. Don't go looking for twenty percent under market value in, in in the southeast, though, because people are too savvy. It's not a thing that I see. Yeah, we we'll talk about trends in a minute as well. Trends with 
trends with those types of properties, trends with tenants. Um, Chris Gray's jumped on, asked us a quick question. Um, half of it, I guess, Akil can honestly answer and half of it, uh, maybe not. Um, what's the minimum deposit required for a buy to let mortgage or could I buy my next property on a residential mortgage and just rent it out? Um, definitely one for you, Akil there. Yeah, so let's start with the latter first. That's, um, can I buy my next property on a resi mortgage? It's not morally, morally right. So, um, you know, first and foremost, it's not morally right. You're in breach of your contract. If the lender ever got news of it, they'll call in the loan. You know, you're going to get black marks potentially on your credit file and so on and so on. So, you know, do the right thing. You know, think of property as a, as a business and do the right thing first and foremost. Um, with regards to the minimum deposit amount required, buy to lets are great. We are now back at up to 85% loan to value. So you can get into a buy to let with as little as 15% deposit. So it's not a million miles away from residential loan to value whatsoever. So minimum loan to value um, is, um, sorry, maximum loan to value is 85%. Um, and then the lower you get to the loan to values, and obviously the rates get more keener and more, more um, um, achievable. So 15% minimum ideally required. Good. Like that, thank you, Akil. Um, this might be a question for you, Mike. Um, with a traditional buy to let, would you be better placed to keep a longer term tenant that pays below market value, or are you better off increasing the rent and risk a tenant leaving and potentially having the property sit empty? I guess it's the question of greed and capitalization on the fact that there is a level of demand and supply issue at the moment versus loyalty to the tenant which which bracket would you fit in at the moment i've got two answers which are going to conflict each other firstly if your flat is a, a thousand pounds a month flat all day long um then you rent it for 950 975 you you'll buy the loyalty of your tenant absolutely no doubt because every time a renewal comes around or any time a problem comes around um, that pushes them onto right move, they'll see that you're giving them a good deal. And, and that temptation to move will be over within 30 seconds when they see another flat in the block available for £50 more than they're paying. So you're buying their loyalty, absolutely no doubt about it. The second point is something that Akil's probably itching to say when we're talking about refinance. If you rent your property under market value and you're looking to raise finance on it, your mortgage lender will look at what it's rented for over and above anything else. So if it's a thousand pound flat and you're giving it away at 800 pounds a month, then you ain't going to raise finance against it because they're looking at the, 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 the payment that's been made on the property. So although it's a good thing to do and it buys your tenants loyalty and you get longer term tenants which in a way will actually increase your income because you don't have those empty periods every every day your house is empty you're losing 35 pounds at that level you're paying your agent to relet it you're paying cleaning costs you're paying maintenance costs you're paying council tax paying gas you're paying electric it kills you when your house is empty but if you're thinking of refinancing and a kill jump in whenever you like here because i'm starting to get in the financial advice category which i'm not um if you're thinking of refinancing then your property should be let at the market value yeah no I, you know i echo everything you said there mike and you've said it um so correctly um just be conscious as mike said around refinancing and what you're getting for it rather than market value first and foremost um but from an investor's point of view and using what being a, a land putting my landlord hat on um <clears throat> it costs to every time to um get a new tenant in the void periods can become very costly um so you might want to take a view sometimes 50 quid under market value can serve you better for the long term um, but it depends how much lower it is than the actual market value. So just be conscious of, I, I would prefer to pay, you know, have a longer tenant in because it does take cost money and arranging um, viewings and so on. Um, I would go with well, what I do. I would go with 50 quid under market value and hold my tenant for longer. That's what I would do if I put on my landlord hat. Um, but just do be conscious of your refinance side of it. But again, Mike did correctly say about the refinancing and, and if it is 10 or 15% below market value, lenders will take a view and they will use that, that, that common sense approach. Um, and they can see that the tenant's been there for a long period of time. So they will take a, a more of a, a, 
as I said, a commercial view on that. So, um, yeah, great question, Andy. Yeah, great question. And one thing that I uh, just to add on the end there that I like to talk about with landlords is when the property's gone on the market, you've had the viewings, you've got the offers. It's nice to talk about the selection and the variety of tenants that are available for that landlord because it gives them the opportunity to feel the balls in their court and they can pick the tenant that feels right for their desire and their needs. And I think if you if you look at just trying over 50 quid on the thousand pounds that we spoke about, well, 50 times 20 months is one month void. So sometimes it makes sense to kind of just go with the safe bet and have the variety, I think. But yeah, great question, Andy. Um, Chris uh, from earlier just said, uh, thanks for the advice. And um, we've got Paul on here as well, kind of just jumping on from what Mike was talking about with uh, kind of architectural and planning and building costs. Um, so you've got Paul there, if anyone's um, thinking, right, I might purchase that and build a big extension on the back. Could I get a double story extension? Has the garage got footings to go over the top? Um, have a chat with Paul. Good to see you on the chat. And if you've got any other questions, Paul, fire them in. Um, we've got a Facebook user user don't know who they are because they're probably not following our personal page this one might be more accountant level than um, than us but how does capital gains tax work does it affect you when flipping a property or when you rent a property out um mike is that something that you want to give a bit of a brief on or, or a kill either of you <laughs> um, yeah, no, so I'm no tax advisor, but um, the CGT element only is only um, uh, due once you've flipped and sold um, that investment properties in short. I think that's probably as much detail as we can give on that. It's very much talk to a good accountant yeah. um, and they will hopefully save you money in the tax area. That's that's what you pay them for. Um, so tax is always one of those that it's not about opinions. It's about doing it right. So jump on and speak to a good accountant. And if someone wants a recommendation on a, a good tax advice accountant, probably all three of us have, have got someone that we could recommend that, that would do you right. Um, getting back to the agenda, and thanks for the questions, and if people have got more, fire them in. Um, we, we were kind of talking um, off camera, Akil, about different ways around uh, ERC penalties, and you were quite keen to sort of bring this into the conversation. So do you want to kind of explain that to everyone and then talk about, you know, that as, the, as a potential property investing option at the moment for people? Yeah, um, it, it, it's linked to what we talked about earlier around the, the BRR strategy. Now, for those of you that are looking to buy property, add value and then refinance using the BRR strategy, please look at or engage with your mortgage brokers to understand the options that are available without any ERC penalty. So for those of you that may have just joined us late in the call, ERC stands for early repayment charge. And what I'm what I'm alluding to here is, is if you're looking to add value to the property, go for a mortgage if, if possible, because that's the cheapest option to, uh, to acquire that property with a no ERC product, which then allows you to do the refurb and then refinance to any lender that you that's applicable to you without any incurring any new charges. So, you know, I'm, I'm happy to provide a couple of options, you know, anytime, any time of the week. Um, for example, there's a lender by the name of Land Bay um, who offer no early repayment charges and, and their rate is tracked by the Bank of England base rate. So from, from my memory, it's a 3.55 on a two year tracker with a 2% arrangement fee, but it allows you to refinance onto another lender, for example, um, anytime that you choose. Now, it's um, now you can't do it so many times. It's not something you can do on a monthly basis, for example, because lenders will catch up on it and not allow you to do it with them. But, you know, if you're doing a couple a year, uh, the lenders like Lambay are keen for that type of business. And clearly they are because they've got a tracker rate mortgage with no early repayment charges. So, you know, for those of those those property investors that are looking to add value to properties in particular, you know, look at those options because bridging, yes, it does serve a great practice and it's a great tool to have in the toolbox. It's slightly more expensive than a, uh, a buy to let loan, but again, it can be quite convenient. So if the property is mortgageable and habitable, then yes, you can go for a no ERC product. But if you're buying a property that's not mortgageable nor habitable or either or, then you may need to go down the bridging route. And that's another useful tool where then you can refinance onto a term product, you know, the day after a month later or six months later, whenever you choose to. And you, you specialize in, in many things, but bridging, I've often spoke to you about. People are scared of it, I think. I don't know, Mike, from your perspective, I see you kind of smile there. I think in, in the general kind of, 
property game people are scared of the bridging word but akil would you would you think that's something that people do need to fear or, or what what maybe is the reasons behind that i think i think if it, there's lots of historical reasons and then the key one here is the interest rates back in the day were very very high and it's only back to like sort of 2010 2012 where rates were at 15 16 17 percent which is which is very dear and I, and I appreciate that however we're now we're now at rates of half a percent a month so the equivalent of six percent per annum which is quite close to you know adverse mortgage rates at six percent per annum so i would say bridging loans do serve a, a great purpose and it's a great tool to have in the book um, with regards to people that are not keen on it, I think <clears throat> it's a conversation I do have with the client and I ask them first and foremost, why? What's the bad experience? And then we will try to iron out those those issues. And then if they're not if they're not, they don't like the word bridging finance, some people call it short term finance. So if you ever heard of say, hey, short term finance, it basically means AKA bridging loans. All right. So it's just another way of, uh, of spicing it up a little. But I think the key thing here for those people that are interested in taking on bridging loans or finding out more information, discuss the nature of the purchase, discuss the nature of the purchase price, the renovation costs and the end value. We'll break it down in very, very simple English terms. So you understand what the pricing looks like and how affordable it is. And the beauty about a bridging loan in short, most of them, most clients do not have to service that loan on a monthly basis. Whereas a mortgage, you've got to service that direct debit on the first of each month. Whereas a bridging loan is great for capital allowance and you don't have to pay the mortgage or any finance payments on a monthly basis because the lender retains the interest for the duration of the loan. So for example, if you take up a six month bridging loan, the lender will take the six months interest and they deduct that off the gross loan on day one. If you decide to repay that loan, say, for example, in month three of the six month loan, they'll just reimburse you and reimburse you that three months interest and put it on the redemption certificate, uh, redemption statement, sorry, with the uh, the conveyancer. So um, it's horses for courses, you know, explore every opportunity. You know, if you're looking to grow that portfolio and scale that portfolio, you've got to leverage, but you've got to leverage um, with the right manner and, and taking up the relevant advice as well. It's, it's really interesting stuff. Uh, Mike, let's let's just sort of look at it from um, from a potential scenario. Let's say that you've got a, a nice property on the market, um, semi-detached, garage on the side, um, single reception room, and it's on the market for kind of, I don't know, 325. And then you're, you're looking at bringing a fourth bedroom over the top with, a, with an ensuite, turning the garage into a, a nice second reception room, maybe going around the back, in 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 the sort of rough Berkshire area, I know it's location location, but what what sort of markup would you expect on a rundown three twenty five to a really nice four bed semi, um, with two reception rooms and two bathrooms upstairs? What what rough sort of uh, capital increase would you expect on something like that around here? Uh, capital increase or rental increase? Well, actual equity increase. Equity, yeah. I mean, oh, yeah, it depends what town you what town you're in and and and, and what level you're in, but. There's every chance right right here, right now, where people, every man and his dog seems to want to upsize. Three bedroom houses have gone like this and four bedroom houses have gone like that. So if you can bridge that gap, then then it feels like there's, there's profit in it. Um, so I know the streets around me where a three bedroom house will be 450 to 500. But a four-bedroom house where they've gone over the garage can be as much as six hundred thousand pounds. But we know that a good over the garage and garage conversion is probably fifty k. So, so yeah. if, you, if you pick your house, then you, 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 you're, you're spending fifty thousand plus, obviously, all your borrowing costs and your mortgage costs while you're doing it. But potentially, you're increasing the, the capital value of your house by anything up to a hundred thousand. So it's options, isn't it? Options to look at. Um, let's talk about trends. You know, we're talking about the world being a very different place at the moment. I'm interested to get Akil's um, input on what landlord trends you're experiencing at the moment or property investment trends in general that are coming to talk to you with maybe different questions to what you were experienced in, in volume 12 months ago. From a tenant perspective, Mike, what's the different types of trends that you're finding with tenant criteria at the moment so that if landlords are looking for that safe bet property investment 
what what is, what is the appeal at the moment from a tenant's perspective for, for those people watching? Same as anybody else, more space, outside space, work from home space, kids are at home more, you're working from home more. Um, and if you're in a flat or, or somewhere without a garden during last summer, this summer you want something with a garden because you don't want to get caught out again. Um, so trends as far as what people are looking to move to is exactly that. The, the, the sort of mid-range houses, somewhere where you're going to be comfortable should you not have a social life for the next 12 months. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's absolute basics on it. Trends as far as tenancies go, as I said earlier, tenancies are getting longer and longer. Um, so people are less inclined to, to jump and flip and move because if you're in a stable job, you're going to stay in your stable job. You're not going to move 100 miles for a new job. Um, because of because of where we are and, and, and where the world stands at the moment. And in the sales market at the moment, we're experiencing a lot of people talking about fourth bedrooms, um, very much being power out for a kill. Um, <laughs> very much fourth bedrooms <laughs> we're be seeing. <laughs> we're seeing fourth bedrooms where they were classed as that box room and now becoming the home office. Um, that's in the sales market. We're seeing people that want to have garages because they want to turn them into gyms or home offices. We're seeing more and more people putting summer houses in the garden and classifying them as a home office or a garden office because um, it's got power and lighting and a broadband connection. Are they adding value at all in any way? Um, in the rental element of things as well. And if you're a landlord that could do that to your property, would you do that for a longer term let? Do you think that's sensible? Uh, yeah, I, I would. Um, a garage was always something as a landlord and as a letting agent, which was a nice to have, but not essential. It was the sort of thing, if you had one house with a garage and one house without a garage, yeah, it might rent slightly quicker it could, because it might attract a certain type of tenant who had a motorbike or was self-employed and was on the tools and needed somewhere to store things. Um, but, but yeah, right here, right now, internal accommodations king. Interesting stuff. Akil, what would be the single most frequent question you're finding from property investors and landlords at the moment when they're coming to you for finance? Um, how much, what's the maximum I can borrow? That's, that's, that's the key question here. A lot of clients are asking us, what's the maximum we can borrow? And, and how cheap can we borrow money at? And our clients actually started back in 2019, especially the portfolio guys and girls, they were actually preempting a housing crash in 2020. What happened was we had something called COVID turn up and, and the market spiked in terms of values and rentals. So what's happened is we've preempted something that didn't go right, but what's actually happened is they know that we've got a housing shortage, we need to pick up, we need to buy property today um, as soon as possible. And the best and how they're adding value to it. And it's great that what you touched on both of you there, you alluded to is how can I make the best out of this property? And and if we're going to look at trends around working from home, the fundamentals is how you add value to any property is by adding a bedroom. That's the first and foremost. Anything else beyond that. So if it's a balcony, it's um, larger kitchen with with desk space to put a laptop on. That's an added benefit. But where can you add a bedroom to employ a, a, an office now going forward? Because you can't work from a couch. It's very difficult. So adding a bedroom or adding an office space is certainly going to add value to any property going forward. And <clears throat> So that's one way of clients have done it. And then the other way is they're adding, they're creating, they're creating, you know, mini HMOs, you know, mini HMOs, getting professional tenants in, but having the right um, services in the area. So great broadband, great communication at door entry and so on and so on, multiple kitchens, so kitchenettes in each room. So they're making them sort of mini hotels. You know, I've got clients that are creating mini, mini hotels within their HMOs and they are fully dressed up. You'd think they're Hilton hotels inside and they're fully equipped with Nescafe, um, Nespresso machines, broadbands on point, you know, uh, keyless entry system. So they're really, really throwing um, everything at it. And I think that is the way to go. I think, you know, you know, a lot of people ask me, do you think London's going to close forever? Are people ever going to go back to the office? To be honest with you, I think they will go back to the office because people will get bored and they want to see their mates and so on. But I think uh working from home is here to stay for quite some time so you know don't 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 um, don't um, shoot yourself in the foot and not do the right thing especially if you are looking to add value to property do it in the right manner and, and follow the trend you know there's a there's a massive saying that don't catch a falling knife follow the trend you know follow the trend 
no, love that. I put myself on mute there just because it sounds like someone's um, destroying the office around the corner. So uh, I didn't want too much echo noise. Um, you've linked us li nicely there onto HMOs, which I think is the next live video that we're going to do um, and really get into to the crux of that. Because much like when we spoke about bridging finance, it's very easy to throw it as a single um, item in a bucket where actually there's so many different varieties to HMOs and investing. Um, and you touched on there some of the fantastic ones I'm seeing on Instagram at the moment with various people at the moment where, you know, you, you would quite happily live there indefinitely because there, there's an awesome setup. Um, but tonight it's been really good to kind of cover trends, um, expectations for 2021 we haven't touched on yet and we will do but it was really good to kind of talk about the different options out there Akil and from your point of view as well um, talking about how people can purchase refurb um, and then get into refinancing and I think it's a good option for people if they want to grow a portfolio quickly um, and they want to take advantage of a property market at the moment where there are deals to be had and there is equity growth to have as well and renting is a safe bet at the moment to put your money. Um, I sold someone a flat today that was a buy to let. Um, she inherited the money. She said to me, it sat in the bank account on 0 0.0000001, making her 1p every year. And she's decided I'm better off putting it into a buy to let. She's never going to live there. It's about a calculation. It's a much safer bet for her than it is to um, leave it in the bank. And that makes sense. So. 2020, uh, 2021 expectations, Mike, from your perspective, for, for the property investors out there, what's your what's your expectations on the market? Just in a quick 30 second snapshot. Yeah, I think it's continued short supply of property, um, continued longer, longer tenancies. Um, and with, with a short supply, longer tenancies, strong rentals. That's Good. my prediction. I can't see anything but so if you are a tenant at the moment, probably it's also a good opportunity. And this is a different show altogether, but to look at getting out of that tenancy, um, or if you are trying to move to a new property to look at getting on the property market, because um, it looks like rents potentially could climb. Um, Akil, from your point of view, what's your expectations on 2021? I think um, I think this is a golden opportunity to um, deploy your cash in the right direction. I think you, we've got we've basically got an open goal here. We've got no hikes in interest, no hikes in capital gains. Income taxes are, are beneficial for everyone at the moment. I think it's an open goal. Invest responsibly. Find great opportunities where you're going to get great yielding assets. I know in London and the Southeast, capital growths are going to be shying away for the next couple of years or so at the moment. But find the right property that's going to wash its own face and service you well and where you can add value. So look for free old properties rather than leasehold because you've got opportunity to add value by doing permitted development, a built planning and so on. So in short, buy freehold, it's a great opportunity to buy, refurb and refinance for long-term hold. And I still think there's so many golden nuggets out there in terms of areas as well. You know, we've got a shortage of housing. We're only a small island. Only 15% is built on, but I think there's great opportunity. So exploit the permitted development um, opportunity yeah. as well, guys. Massively agree. Um, Paul, from an architectural point of view, just come in with a last question just as we were about to wrap up and get home for some tea. Um, and he's asking, guys, I find a lot, because obviously Paul's in architectural design and uh, design and build, I find a lot of my clients are obsessed about extending from a four bed to a five bed, which option uh, op often results in a compromised space. Um, we rather sell luxurious four beds or small five beds and i think he means would we rather sell a more luxurious four bed or a small five bed um difficult question to answer because i guess it's very very different mike is a big fan of four he's put and and akil's going five so i think when you're looking at it from hard a resident, to, hard to sell a house with a silly layout if you're, if you're chopping and you're changing and you're building corridors to in order to cram in another room people are going to find it weird people won't understand it people don't, won't know why you've done it if you end up with three single rooms it's a valid point you know it's a great point mike because you've got l-shaped rooms you might turn that five bed into the reason why i said five um i'm not disagreeing with mike whatsoever and i do agree with what he said the only reason why i said a five because that small little dingy bedroom could be that home office so i'm looking at that opportunity from that perspective but i'm not disagreeing with mike it's um it's horses for courses 
And I guess it depends on the desired outcome, doesn't it? If you are doing that, Paul, because your client is going to live there for the next 15 years and the benefit to them is X, then that, it doesn't matter what the equity growth is, what the rental value is. If they're doing it because they want to turn it into a rental, then um, a snapshot, I guess, Mike, you would value a five bed um, from a rental perspective higher than you would often value a four bed by standard. Um, by sales valuation, maybe not so much. Um, He's just nailed it in the comments. Most people only need four bedrooms. Most people only need four bedrooms. He's thinking down my lines. <laughs> He knows the answer to the question, um, unless you're getting into HMOs, which again is for the next show, um, because that's that's something different there again. I think th the word luxury was mentioned in there, Paul, as well. And I think when you get into luxury, you expect to see big rooms. I think you expect to see that space. When you're getting into um, rental value or HMOs or um different types of setups then potentially the fifth bedroom is like akil says very vital for people at the moment um and yeah often people do need four rooms but i, I know a lot of people at the moment they're looking at three-story luxury houses because they want the top floor bonus room as a really nice games room cinema room gym workout room um and trends have changed you know the world is a different place now so um we could talk about that forever we don't have the crystal ball but it's exciting to find out where we'll be in 12 months time because if we think 12 months ago from now we wouldn't have ex expected the property market to be doing this so you know it's good times um mike thank you for your time akil thank you very much for your um wisdom experience and time as well and uh we will join everyone soon no doubt thanks for having me all the best